namaste. One of our viewers wrote with a really good question, and it's a question I'm surprised hasn't been asked before. In any case, I've made reference to this question many times in many videos, but I've never really explained the whole thing in one package, so here goes. The question is, what is the relationship or what is the difference between Krishna or Vishnu and Shiva and Shakti and the various scriptures and philosophies in their names and so on. That's in a nutshell. <laughs> and he goes on to say that uh, how is this all related to the void and like that? Well, let me try to explain. In the original Vedic version, the Vedas, Upanishads, and Vedanta, there is a unified view of the whole cosmos of spirituality. And it goes like this. Brahman is the basis of everything. But Brahman is without boundaries, qualities, actions, changes, or anything like that. So he cannot create because to create would be to draw boundaries and make changes and like that. So he emanates Shakti. In other words, Shakti is the first creation. And he invests her with all his powers and qualities and the desire to create. This is called Icha Shakti. So then Icha Shakti begins to act, and this is Kriya Shakti. Huh? So Kriya Shakti, first thing she does is create forms. This is described in great detail in Lakshmi Tantra in the early chapters. First thing she does is create forms of Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma and herself also. And the forms of herself that she creates become the uh, wives or shaktis of the f god forms that she creates. Huh? Like Lakshmi becomes the consort of Vishnu. And Saraswati becomes the consort of Brahma. So like that. So all the gods, all the different forms of gods have shaktis who are their real powers. Try to understand. They don't have independent power or existence, but both their power and existence depends on shakti. Shakti comes first. In fact, there's a whole chapter in the Devi, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, that Vishnu is portrayed as the all and everything, right? But wait a minute, where is Vishnu? He's sitting on the throne of Anantashesha, Sankarshan. And where is Sankarshan? He is sitting in the ocean of milk, right? So Vishnu is dependent on Sankarshan, and Sankarshan is dependent on the ocean of milk. But wait a minute, an ocean or any body of liquid needs a container, huh? something to put it in, a kunda, a bowl. So what is the container of the ocean of milk and the other oceans? That's Shakti. So see, all the great powers of the universe are ultimately dependent on Shakti for creating the environment in which they reside and so on. They are also dependent on her for their powers. 
So, all right, let's go back to the original question. What about Vishnu? Or he mentions Krishna, that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that he is everything. Well, what he actually says is Vasudeva Sarva Mitti. Vasudeva is everything. And Vasudeva has several meanings, one of which refers to Krishna, the incarnation at the end of the Dwapara Yuga and the beginning of Kali Yuga. And the other refers to the four vyuha forms, Vasudeva, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. Which one is he referring to? He doesn't say. <laughs> so the fanatical Vaishnavas take this to mean that Krishna is everything and that even Brahman is coming from him which completely contradicts the Vedas. So, okay, basically you have three divisions of religion in the Vedic civilization. And that is Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and Shaktaism. Or is this called Vaishnava, Shaiva, and Shakta religions? So these three are always vying for supremacy in the social environment, but at their root, they are actually the same thing. Just using different metaphors, different symbolic languages to describe the same thing. And what is that? God is everything and God does everything and God is in control of everything. So just relax and do your sadhana and then you return to where? The pure creation. Before the three modes of material nature become active. See, <clears throat> this is called moksha or mukti, depending on the level and type. So what is the pure creation? When the creation is first made, the three modes of material nature, sattva, rajas, and tamas, are in balance. They're inactive. So there's no time. There's no space as such. There's only consciousness and lots and lots of energy. <laughs> But when, once the creation becomes manifest, then the three modes are also competing with one another. Sometimes the mode of goodness is dominant, sometimes passion, sometimes ignorance. So that's what we see in the manifest world. And it seems to be very confusing because each one claims to be supreme. And of course, relative to a human being, they might as well, each one might as well be supreme. But in reality, in the big picture, uh, the universal picture, the sattva guna generally tends toward liberation. The raja guna tends toward suffering. And the tamaguna tends toward animal birth. So those people in whom the sattva guna is dominant get moksha or mukti. Those in whom the rajas passion is dominant are reborn as human beings in one condition or another. And those in whom tamas, ignorance, is dominant are reborn in the animal species. So, okay, what does this have to do with these three religions now? The Vaishnavas worship Vishnu as the supreme god. Sometimes they get a little carried away. Uh, the whole Mahabharata was written only 5,000 years ago, or maybe even less than that. Uh, most scholars today accept that it was written between 12 and 1400 years ago. And the religion that's preached in the Mahabharata, which includes Bhagavad Gita, 
is basically Vaishnavism. And Vaishnavism says, become situated in the mode of goodness and then you can approach God. But Shaivism is descended from a completely different interpretation, the Tamil culture in South India. Vaishnavism is basically uh, situated in North. And Shaivism is basically in the Tamil culture in the South. There's several states where Tamil culture and viewpoints are actually dominant. And in, these, in this culture, Shiva is the supreme god and everything comes from him. <laughs> Shiva Shakti. And the, this is also the home of Tantra. The Tantra is the Shakta religion, the worship of the goddess. And the main differences between Vaishnavism, Shaivism and Shaktaism is that Shaivism and Shaktaism don't make any distinction among the three modes. Because ultimately they're all illusion. Maybe Sattva Guna, you can say, is better than the others uh, because it's nonviolent and philosophical and pious and so on like that. But ultimately all three of them are Maya. Huh? And so Shiva and Shakti also offer a direct route to the pure creation, which does not rely on an abundance of rules and regulations. Now, especially in Tantra, which is a subspecialty of uh, Shaktaism, there are rights and there are rules and so on pertaining to those rights. But ultimately, in both systems, Shaiva and Shaktism, they give up all the rights and they are in pure meditation on the void. Now, what is the void? The void is actually Brahman. But since Brahman is devoid of any kind of thingness, any kind of relative being, huh? or any kind of manifestation, Brahman is completely unmanifest. So when we first enter re a relation or a perception of Brahman, it looks like nothing, no thing. Huh? So it seems to be a completely empty void. And the more we go into it, we find it's not even like just an empty space. That's Akash. That's still a material element, one of the tattvas. But it's a space with no space, no time, no directions, no dimensions, no boundaries. Uh, in fact, becoming and manifestation are impossible in that space, in the void. So the Buddha recommended meditation on the void, and so does Lord Shiva, and so does Shakti in the advanced portions of Tantra. But the thing about it is, when you meditate on the void, there's still something there. You. <laughs> Who is aware of the void? Who is meditating on the void? It's you. When you realize this, you, you laugh for a long time, I promise. <laughs> and what are you? Consciousness. So this consciousness that is you is filling up this void and perceiving that there's nothing to perceive. In Buddhist philosophy, this is called the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. You can't really tell if you are perceptive because there's nothing to perceive. <laughs> so, of course, this is right next door to Nirvana. <laughs> Nirvana is simply realizing that the 
void is full of consciousness and the consciousness is you and you, the consciousness, are all that is and you, the consciousness, can be the object of your consciousness. And at that point, you have everlasting, unlimited bliss. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung.